Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. The number you have reached is not in service. Daddy? Daddy, who did this to you? He's dead. Someone tortured him. You get out of there right now. You don't know that town. There's something broken there. I'm not coming home, Mama, until I find out I did this. Well, I sure as hell hate to be the one you're going to go see. Stay away from the brothers. What brothers? And daddy cared for you so much. They killed him. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Pekovich, and this is episode number 308. Releasing in theaters across the US on November 20 and on video on demand on November 24 is Girl, a revenge thriller that stars Bella Thorne as a young woman who returns to her hometown to seek revenge upon her father, only to find herself in a life or death situation against the corrupt town sheriff played by the legendary Vicky Rourke. A modern day western of grit, character, and engrossing story. Gill also marks the directorial feature debut of Chad Faust, who also stars in the film. And I'm glad to say that Chad is joining me now on a Matt's Movie Reviews podcast. Chad, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. So, I've been doing a bit of research in regards to this movie and you making it, and it's really interesting. You said in, a, in, one, in an interview that you were in your career about 10, 15 years deep. You didn't feel like you were really connecting with some of the projects you were doing. So you did what any great artist would do. You create your own content. And I'm just curious, mm-hmm. what was that first idea? Was that, was that spark that kind of led to the, the genesis of what we see now mm-hmm. on the screen in Girl? Yeah, thank you for that question. It was, it was a hard moment because at that point as an adult, I'd only made my living as an actor. That's the only place I'd ever made money. And the day I called my reps and said, I'm out, um, I'm no longer auditioning for anything, um, you know, it was such a leap of faith. And ultimately it came down to, you know, this was one of the early projects. It wasn't actually the first one. Mm-hmm. I, I had written one called Monumental, which I, I um, eventually produced. And it, got, it ended up coming out under a different name. Um, and it just, it just was sort of the whole process was kind of, I felt like, okay, suddenly this is happening. And it was such a heartbreaking process because the movie just didn't work out the way I I had hoped it would. And, um, I just thought, okay, I'm going to have to get more involved. You you know, if I, I was now working on projects I cared about, but I wasn't necessarily getting to see them through as the, you know, the main creative voice. And so I thought if I'm going to give birth to children, I better raise them as well. So I decided that I was, if anyone was going to screw up this baby, it was going to be me. So I, mm-hmm. I just took, I took it on, I took it on and this one had such a personal, I had such a personal connection to the themes around it that I, I needed to, I needed to take this one on myself. So, and I've written other ones too, then some that I'm, you know, releasing to other people and then, um, some that I just had to keep my hands on myself. So I also read that you were on location in kind of like a small town, maybe similar mm. to something that was is in the movie um, Girl. And you had, you kind of imagined, uh, you had a vision of kind of like a girl walking down like empty streets, kind of like almost like a Western kind of thing. And I've described the movie as a modern day Western because you could definitely feel that motive. Um, mm-hmm. You also said that she was carrying, you knew that she was carrying a weapon of some kind. I'm curious though, when did that transition to her carrying a hatchet? How did you know that that was going to be the weapon of choice for this character? Yeah, uh, for the first part of your your comment is like, you know, I think this started as a Western because I conceived of it in California and I even shot the short films leading up to it in California. And then eventually it was going to become more of like a, a Southern Western. I was, we were going to shoot in Georgia at one point and then we ended up shooting in Canada and it became a Northern, which was sort of an interesting kind of twist. You know, I actually liked it because it sort of took the Western genre and, you know, kind of. Uh, perverted it a little bit and made it allowed it to be its own thing. Um, and then, as far as the hatchet goes, I think that came pretty early on, mostly because I liked the idea that the you know the hatchet obviously it has her father's initials on it hmm. um, engraved in the head, and so it was you know and as she finds her father's you know long handled axe, it became you know you know representative of this father daughter combo, and 
and and was the one thing they had bonded over. And so it was also, you know, it's I think it's obviously a trope in the sort of Western genre, but much more so it was symbolic of her subconscious desire, which was to to really find out, you know, if her father loves her or not. I also read that the original kind of screenplay, the direction you're going for was more kind of like a, uh, how would you describe it? Kind of like more of a comic book kind of orient- orientated, kind of like fantastical kind of kind of uh, direction. Mm. Um, when does that mm. kind of switch to a more kind of gritty, a palpable kind of character piece that we see now? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I think com- some of it came down to casting. You know, you know, as soon as it was Bella and Nikki, I knew it wasn't going to be this sort of heightened, you know, put on, uh, you know, world. It was going to be. Ha- it was going to have to be much more gritty and authentic because these two, you know, they're not. Um, they're not lightweights, you know, pretending to be heavyweights. They are true heavyweights. And I, I thought I have to embrace, to embrace this and, and really let this be true and authentic. And also ultimately it was, I think a result of my own maturation to the earlier versions. It was much more, yeah, co- yeah comic booky and, um, you know, playful. And I thought, you know what, if I'm really going to talk about some, some themes that mean something to me, I think I might just want to, you know, I might want, I just want to go for it. And, you know, and if, if my career does, get the opportunity to evolve into some of these bigger genres. This might be my one time to make a real, you know, underbelly kind of story. Mm. You know, I'm a big proponent of character, uh, sorry, uh, as place, as character, um, whether it be a uh, location, setting, house, what have you. And um, the the town in this movie, the County of Gold, uh, which is kind of ironic on the gold because it's anything but really when, you, when you're watching it, you feel kind of the greediness of it all. Um, mm-hmm. You said before you shot it in Canada. Um, you also... I also read that the town that you found was too clean for you. Uh, I had one thing <laughs> yeah. you said was it had sidewalks. It's like, we can't have this. This, <laughs> this cannot happen. Um, what was the process yeah. like in transforming this town that you found to make sure that it suits the aesthetic that you were really looking for, for your movie? Yeah, that was, I was, I was thanking the, thanking God for my production designer, Alexis Debat and my art director, uh, Dave Morris, who, uh, gosh, nobody worked, harder on this film than they did. They, I don't think they even slept. I, I know this because I shared a, a lake house with them during production. They, um, they, they transformed this world. I mean, it was, it was just a, resp- you know, it was, it was a small broken town, but all the decay was sort of in the urban centers, which mm. this was meant to be a, a more, you know, ruralized place. And but when it, you got into the rural, it's actually where the, where the money went in this town and the houses were, you know, were well kept because, you know, with moisture up there, they, they wouldn't last long if they, if they, if they weren't. And so, it was strange. I almost considered like setting it in more of the setting it in the urban decay, kind of like a deer hunter, Pennsylvania steel town yeah. kind of vibe. And I just, it just, I would, it would have required, um, you know, far too many, you know, other problems. Like why do they keep running into each other? If it's a, you know, more of an urban, just, there's just a lot of issues. So um, I, I had to, yeah, we had to really create some of these things, um, which wasn't what I had hoped for, but it just, I, as soon as I heard Northern Ontario, I just assumed it was going to be like some of the towns I visited up in Northwest Territories and the Yukon where there's, you know, they just snow, they're battling against nature all the time. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a losing, it's a losing war for any human, but this, this place, they, they they seem to be winning the war. Mm. You know, you've shot this film in 15 days, which is just a really like a whirlwind kind of uh, production right there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. how, how important is it um, with uh, having a shooting schedule like that? How important is it to have really strong kind of pre-production and down before you really um, batten down the hatches and, and go to war and, and shoot your movie? Yeah, it's absolutely essential. And I, I, I had wished we'd had like another two weeks of pre-production because there just wasn't as much time to do, you know, pre on set and, you know, we, there wasn't even honestly time to do a storyboard. It, just, it, it was just insane because everything kept pivoting and adjusting and we got our locations too late because it, was such, it wasn't the perfect town to shoot in. So, um, you know, it was very challenging. The only reason I think we survived was um, all the preparation I had done before going into pre-production. And mm-hmm. then thankfully my cinematographer was a beast on his feet. Uh, most of those lighting setups were done in 15 minutes. And the other reason it was Bella Thorne is like a first take actor. She was always, her first take was always the best. And we'd do like maybe two or three just to be safe, but I always would use the first. So um, that was allowed us to be really, really light. And we had two cameras for, for like, not, I think we had two cameras for most of the shoot. Yeah. Like, like 12 of the days or something like that. So that, that also helped a lot, but you know, uh, it's what we pulled off. Honestly, was like, it was a small miracle. I don't, 
I don't even take credit for it. <laughs> I think the, the, the two character setup is really key there because I was talking to an Australian filmmaker only last week. He shot his film in 10 days and he said two cameras really really helped a lot in regards to getting all that coverage and such. So I'm sure that you're, you're very happy to have made that decision. Yeah, it's it's challenging, you know, because you can't, especially, you know, the cinematographer could only really, you know, because he was also operating, he only had red eyes on one. And so sometimes you're relying on cam the B camera, but it, it ended up not being exactly what was discussed. That, that was particularly difficult when I was in front of the camera. So yes. I, I, I wasn't able to have eyes on both. And so there was times when all of my preparation was with the cinematographer, but then B camera that we were relying on was being in the hands of somebody who wasn't a part of those discussions. So looking, looking uh, in the future, I would actually involve the B camera operator much more in our, our discussions. Regarding Bella Fawn, you said that she knew the character of girl better than you did. Um, when a actor has a such a personal connection with a role like that um what happens to the script i mean are there changes made does she bring kind of input to it that kind of changes the way that the character is portrayed and in so also how the movie is structured around that character mm, yes yeah, that's that's such in, that's so insightful uh yeah she you know i kept saying like yeah my, my the second part of that sentence was and i'm so sorry that you understand this character better than i do <laughs> uh it's a result of a, of a tough life you know yeah and um you know, I, I honestly, I, the character didn't change that much because of it. It was more like there were some moments like when she first discovers her father, you know, um, the way I had written it was much more like the, sort of the first tender moment we see from her. And she actually wanted there to be some rage in that moment as well. Hmm. Um, and, you know, some of the physicalization of that rage that comes out was all, all her idea. Other than that, I mean, um, I think we were we were very much in sync. It was more just that you know she, we we had a we had a great trust in each other um, that allowed me to kind of give her a lot of uh, empowerment and authority to kind of uh, move where she wanted to move, do what she wanted to do, and I think she you know respected my scripts to the same degree that she she honored what I wrote. So it was it was a very uh, you know mutually respectful uh, kind of collaboration. 15 days shoots, two and a half of those days were with the legendary Mickey Rourke. I believe he's one of the greatest actors of any generation. He's also quite a bit of a character as well. Having two and a half, <laughs> two and a half days with him, what was that like? Um, because <laughs> he plays such a big part of the role, but you have a limited amount of time with us. So you have to get a lot of coverage, I'm sure. What was the experience like to be on a Mickey Rourke uh, carnival ride? Yeah, it's uh, it's one for the one for the memoirs for sure. He he, um, you know, he doesn't have to work very hard to be good, and if he yeah. tries, if he works just a little bit, he's great. And I knew my job was going to be to try to get him to care enough to work a little hard and be great. Um, I, I was you know constantly trying to get communication with him leading into the film, and I just I wasn't able to get it. And you know he you know so we, we was, it was like a blind date on day one with him. Um, and wasn't sure what was going to happen. And honestly, he, he kind of just takes control and has his um, the way he wants to do it. And, you know, I, I had to make a quick decision to fight him on it or surrender. And I surrendered. And I'm so glad I did because, you know, I think it really added to the power and, and authority of his character that I think we got something much more terrifying and unique um, compared to if I had sort of asserted my own agenda with him. And, you know, uh, a lot of it kind of came off script, which was the exact opposite of how Bell and I were working. Mm. But I think that worked, you know, it was almost like sometimes, sometimes actors need to be working in the same way. And sometimes it works really well when they're working in oppositional ways. And um, like, I know, like, for example, like the, that great movie, A Knife in the Water, I think it was Polanski's first film, I think. Um, he had like a veteran actor, is that movie on the boat? It was like the, um, the veteran actor, the, um, the, the acting student and a non-actor all in that same movie. And they, as a result, you know, the veteran actor was the sort of one holding authority. The, the student was always trying to prove himself and the non-actor just really didn't care. You know? yeah. And it was, so, it was so per such perfect casting. And I, I had to kind of embrace uh, the same similar kind of dynamic with, with, uh, with this. You said that uh, Mickey Rourke's character in the film, um, simply named Sheriff, um, he is undergoing a battle of spiritual warfare. And there are reasons for that. There's a great monologue near the end of the film, actually, which kind of talks about that. And it's kind of interesting in that going back to the town, the county of gold, it almost seems like a, a town that God has forgotten, like 
um, you have like central to the town is this church and it's kind of boarded up and it almost seems like a forsaken kind of place. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because you did a short film called um, Oh God um, a several uh, mm -hmm. few years back and it kind of, there were similar kind of themes in that as well. Um, that theme of kind of like this kind of central spiritual warfare in the center of this thing, among other themes as well, how important was that to really kind of pinpoint that as really kind of like an essential part of this movie, especially considering, you know, town, a uh, uh, place as character and the place in your film is a very strong character indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a incredibly important and actually becoming, I think, the stuff that I'm writing now even more prevalent, you know, these little recurring themes that happen over a body of work, you know. Um, and, and I think, you know, there was there was a line that Mickey's character had, was scripted to say, I don't, I don't it's not in the movie anymore, uh, where he says, you know, we're, um, we're all in God's blind spot now this, in this town, you know. Um, and that, that idea I found so fascinating. It was like almost like, what, is, what does a town without God look like? Well, it, it sort of regresses into, you know, uh, pleasure is good, pain is bad. And, and, you know, what is a town where it's, it's just all about self-service? You know, what does that look like? And, you know, and, sh and her presence in this town kind of wakes, wakes things up. You know, and that's something I find really interesting. I guess, I guess what I'm, what I was, what I'm trying to explore over all these projects is like, who, who are we as a people? Mm. You know, and and of course, we, in order to look at that, we have to look at, you know, what made us, if it's if it's God or nature or whatever else. But, um, and and you know, I, I you know I personally believe we were, we were, we were created, you know, by by by. Um, you know, some sort of uh, loving divinity, but you know, then who is? What is the character of that of that of that creation, and, and why? Why? Why are we? Why were we made? You know, especially given all the suffering that we go through. And so, I suppose it's trying to get at some of those core questions. And um, I, I wanted that to be more in this film than it was, but. Um, you know, those those are some of the some of the, the lines that end up getting cut, and they just don't they don't really really land. Um, they just you know they don't they don't make the cut. So. Well, it's something that really resonated with me when I was watching it. And look, um, Chad, I just want to say congratulations with this film. I absolutely love Girl, and everyone now. Oh, thanks, man. See it um, out in the US. November 20th in theaters, VOD, uh, November 24th, Chad Faust. Look, congratulations once again. You did really great work here and 15 days uh, shooting to have all the actors that you had and to get the performances that you did and yourself a great performance as well. Just congrats once again and thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate all the research you did too that we could you know, sort of evolve the questions. That's really helpful.